The Mutual Broadcasting System, in cooperation with Family Theater Incorporated, presents The Unsung Hero, starring Lee Bonnell and Gail Storm. Mona Freeman is your hostess. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Ever notice how quick many people are to complain about difficulties and inconveniences? I guess that is only natural. But when you come right down to it, isn't there always so much for which each of us ought to be thankful? Yes, we should be thankful for good health, thankful for our homes, for our families, for the peace and happiness we can have together. You know, a lot of the unhappiness and misunderstanding in a home comes when parents forget God, when they think they can do the job of raising a family alone. We need God's help, all of us do. We need the help of faith and prayer. And because we're really all interested and earnest about peace and unity in our homes, we should take time out for prayer, for family prayer. Daily family prayer is a wonderful practice. It means peace and understanding in a family. It means each one of us living for the other and all living for God. Mona Freeman returns following tonight's family theater story, The Unsung Hero, starring Gail Storm and Lee Bonnell. There are men whose names are not prominently recorded in the pages of history. Men who helped establish well-known traditions in our nation. Such a man was John A. Logan. This is his story. On a warm afternoon in June, 1855, in the river village of Shawnee Town in southern Illinois, the quiet of the little town is suddenly disturbed. A horse and buggy are driven swiftly along the dusty road of the main street bordering on the Ohio River. The small carriage slows down and comes to a stop in front of a large, comfortable-looking house. A dark, handsome young man jumps from the carriage and mounts the steps. Good afternoon. Is Captain... Uh, Mr. Cunningham at home. Yes, sir. Won't you come in? Thank you. He's right in here. A gentleman to see you, Father. Ex-Lieutenant Logan reporting, sir. John. Why, John Logan. Well, this is a surprise. So good to see you again. How are you, sir? <laughs> it's good to see you. Father, is this Lieutenant Logan who marched to Mexico with you? The same, Robert. Oh, uh, my son Robert, John. He's often heard me speak of you. How do you do, Robert? I've heard of you, too. I'm proud to know you, sir. Well, uh, what brings you to Shawnee Town, John? The circuit court session, sir. Oh, I've heard you were a full-fledged lawyer now. Tell me about it. Come on, sit down. Over here by this window, John. It's cooler. Thank you. <laughs> well, I hear you've become prosecuting attorney. How do you like the law after the army, huh? Well, just as exciting, but uh, not quite so dangerous, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't the same complaint. Running a government land office isn't so exciting, but it can be dangerous the way the settlers are flocking down the Ohio. Yeah, it does keep me busy. I can imagine. Let's hope all the northerners who are coming in now won't change southern Illinois too much. Personally, I like our southern ways. And I. But uh, a little Yankee get up and get. Father, you <laughs> had the right time. Huh? Oh, excuse me. I didn't know you had a visitor. Oh, uh, Mary, my dear, I want you to meet Lieutenant Logan. You've heard me tell how we were together in the Mexican campaign. How do you do, Lieutenant Logan? Why, Mary, uh, Miss Cunningham, 
Your father often spoke of his little daughter, but <laughs> I thought you were a little girl. <laughs> Not anymore, sir. I'm 17. And a very lovely 17, Miss Mary. Why, thank you, sir. Oh, if you'll excuse me, father. I see Jerome Watts' buggy turning in. He's taking me to the Miller's singing party. Certainly, my dear. Goodbye. Goodbye, Lieutenant Logan. Perhaps I shall see you again. I hope so. In fact... I know you will. <laughs> well, you're welcome to call as often as you can, John. Uh, now, there are some questions on our new land laws that I'd like to ask. Miss Mary, I've driven down from Murfreesboro for the fair. I was wondering if I might have the pleasure of your company. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Logan. I've promised to go with George Tucker. But Father and Mother would be delighted to have you go with them, I'm sure. May I take you to the dance this evening, Miss Mary? Why, uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Logan, yes. I'll be ready at eight. I was going to ask you if you'd care to go for a stroll along the river, Mary, but I see you're going out. Well, I was, John, but I'd much rather go for a stroll along the river. I'll get my cape. Here's a nice place. Suppose we sit down here a moment. I'd like to. This has always been my favorite view of the river from these bluffs. I come up here and watch the river boats. Mary, perhaps it's a little soon for me to be saying this, but, well, you must know how I feel about you. Oh. And I, I, I hope it's not too soon for you to know whether or not you like me, or if someday you might be loving me. It's not too soon, John. I do love you. Oh, Mary. Mary, darling, and you, you'll marry me soon? Oh, John, I was hoping, but I thought you were going to take a long, long time to say it. the coming of autumn that year, Mary Cunningham became Mrs. Mary Logan. And before another year rolled around, young John Logan had become a member of the Illinois State Legislature. It was July 1858, the beginning of the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates, when men were being torn between party loyalty and loyalty to a purpose. <laughs> Through Illinois, throughout the whole country, men listened and weighed the words of Stephen Douglas, the Little Giant, and Honest Abe Lincoln. Mr. Lincoln, it is my contention that the people of each state and each territory ought to be permitted to regulate their own domestic institutions in their own way. Judge Douglas... You must remember that a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I'm afraid Mr. Lincoln is right, Mary. Well, if that's true, John, then, then you and Judge Douglas... Judge Douglas and all of us who have been following him have been mistaken. Tragically mistaken. But you can't reverse your whole position, John. Oh, I haven't come to this conclusion easily, Mary. The Lord knows I've been the friend and champion of Stephen Douglas for years. I was ready to support him for president, but since listening to Mr. Lincoln, I'm convinced that Douglas has taken the wrong road. But, John... Well, you've just been elected to Congress, and you're pledged to support Senator Douglas' platform. I'll support it, and him, Mary, as long as I can support my country at the same time. But if it comes to a crisis, I'll be forced to declare myself on the side of Abraham Lincoln. Well, perhaps it won't go that far. Well, I'm afraid the house is already divided. Mary, I must go back to Washington right away. Well, we can leave... No, and... I want you to go home. Home? It's the but... folks there. 
Southern Illinois is so much a part of the South, I'm afraid they're going to let their sympathies run away with them. Well, what do you want me to do, John? Well, try to make them realize, your father, our friends, everyone, that loyalty to their country is more important than loyalty to a section of it. Does this mean you're going against Douglas? Against the South? Well, you can prepare them for, what, for that, and when the time comes, well, I'm forced to take a stand. I'll personally explain why I've made my decision. John Logan's immediate fears were unfounded, but with the election of Lincoln came secession. Then, on April 12, 1861, with the firing on Fort Sumter, war between the states began. John Logan quickly concludes his affairs in the nation's capital and hurries back home. It is past midnight as his train pulls into Carbondale, Illinois, some 20 miles from the Logan home in Marion. Logan steps down and starts across the station platform. John! Oh, there you are, Mary. Oh, John, dear, it's so good to see you. Yes, your message. Why did you want me to get off here instead of coming directly home? I'll explain to you, dear. The buggy's right over here. You drove over alone at this time of night? It was the only way. John, things are in such a dreadful state here. People, well, some are for the north, but many more are for the south. Even Robert. Your brother? Yes. He's he's run away from school and joined the Confederate Army. And there are so many others. Now they're talking of breaking away from the rest of the state and joining the South. That mustn't happen. It would be disastrous. It would mean all supplies coming down the Ohio and Mississippi would be cut off. But, John, they're determined. And they're suspicious of you. That's why I had to meet you here and warn you. They've heard rumors that you favor the North. Well, I'm here to confirm those rumors. John, do you have to get into public affairs at this time? Wouldn't it be better if... Mary, every man has a duty to himself to do what he believes is right, even if it means personal sacrifice. But there's going to be trouble. These public meetings they're having. Oh, John, please promise me something. You know I'd do anything you ask. Please keep away from these meetings. It will just mean... Well, Mary... This is something bigger than either you or I. I can only do what I think is right. Come in, Jeff. Come in. Aren't you a little early? John, if you're ready, I think we'd better get right over to the square. There's a crowd milling around there for the last hour, and it's getting excitable and unruly. Oh, John, please. I'm ready, Jeff. Good. This is a day that'll decide which way southern Illinois will go. John, you will be careful. Oh, don't worry, Mary. I have friends in the crowd. If there's going to be any trouble, we'll be able to handle things. You bet we will. I wish you'd take my advice and not go, John. Oh, listen, sweetheart. There's nothing you have to worry about. I only hope you're right. <laughs> Please, may I get through? Not through here, lady. This place is taken. You ought to get here earlier. Uh, Miss Mary, uh, Miss Mary, I hardly knew you in those old clothes. What? Uh, you can stand over here. Uh, can't see much, but he's speaking from that wagon. Oh, thank you. Yes, sure, ma'am. Oh, I know you. You were in the same regiment with my father and Lieutenant Logan in the Mexican War. That's right, ma'am. And, and there's Gabe Cox over there. We got a few of the old timers sprinkled around. We thought we'd come today in case we might be needed. There's Mr. Logan now, getting up on the wagon. Which side of the fence are you on? With apologies to the ladies present. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a time for me to be lighthearted. It's a serious moment, a serious day and hour. We're all faced with a great decision. For two hours, John Logan spoke argued, persuaded. His earnestness, his logic held the surrounding crowd. The time has come when a man must be for or against his country, not for or against his state. I, for one, shall stand or fall for this union and shall enlist this day in the Union Army. I want as many of you as will to come with me. If you say no, may God protect you. 
I'll come with you, John. And I am John. Yeah. Yeah. The war between the states began. Logan was commissioned with the rank of colonel. Colonel Logan's regiment reports at Belmont. Brigadier General Logan leads the Union troops into Vicksburg. Major General Logan commands the 15th Division, Army of the Tennessee. This was war with all the sufferings men in the field endure. General Logan, sir, we just got word that Claiborne's troops surprised the rear flank two miles down the road. General McPherson was killed. No. McPherson? Oh, may God have mercy on him. As fine a man as I've met. You're in acting command now, sir. Yes, I know. Will we carry through with the plans of moving into action, sir? It's not a reconnaissance patrol. This is a dirty business war. The sooner we get it over, the better. This was war with all the sorrow that those who remain at home must suffer. The uncertainty, the hazard, the heartbreak. Mr. Saunders? Mr. Saunders, is there any mail for me this morning? No, Mrs. Logan. I was trying to creep by so you wouldn't see me. Uh, maybe tomorrow. I guess there's no mail this morning, Mr. Saunders. Yes, indeedy. I've got something here for you. Oh, is it from... Well, I think it may be from the general, Mrs. Logan. Uh, now, where did I put that? Uh, yes, here it is. Oh, thank you. It's from the general, all right. I sure wish I was with him. Why, I remember in the Mexican campaign... Excuse when... me, Mr. Sanders. Yes. I think I'll go in and... You, you wouldn't mind if I wait and get any news you might be having. Oh, of course. Let me just look through it first. You take your time. I'll, I'll sit here on the porch. Oh. What's wrong, Mrs. Logan? Oh, thank heavens he's right. He's all right now. Well, what happened? He was wounded at Fort Donaldson. That's why I didn't hear from him. But he's back with his command. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. You had me jump in there for a minute. This old ticker of mine isn't what it used to be in the Mexican campaign. Oh, this is good news. He thinks the war's going to end very soon. Oh, I'd sure be glad of that, ma'am. Headquarters, Armies of the United States. Special Orders. Major General John A. Logan will replace General O. O. Howard as commander of the Army of the Tennessee. General Logan will proceed in full command of said army in the Grand Review. Not like marching through the Carolina swamps, eh, Joe? Uh, not much it ain't. Listen to them cheering Logan up there. Sure glad we're with him on our last march. Yeah, me too. You know, I'd be kind of sorry this is our last march with Logan uh, if the end of this march wasn't home. It all looks the same, Mary. The town, the gardens. You know, it's remarkable how events and people change so much. The place is so little. Have I changed, John? You. Only to grow more lovely. Thank you, dear. Ah, oh, it's good to be strolling along these familiar streets again. How do you do, Judge? Oh, morning, John. 
Morning, Joe. How are you, General? Well, Sanders, how are you today? Good morning, General. Glad to see you looking so well. Yes, I'm feeling fine. Well, I'll see you at the banquet tomorrow night, General. It's good to see old friends again, Mary. I'm glad you suggested walking home from the church. I'm just happy to have you to myself for a little while, John. Ever since you came home, you've been so busy. Banquets and reunions and invitations and visitors. Yes, I know, Mary. And it troubles me a little, all these celebrations for the returning soldiers. Of course, they deserve all the honors, but for the ones who have given most, there can be no celebrations. I know, dear, but you mustn't let it worry you too much. You've done all any man could do and more. Now enjoy being a private citizen again. Oh, good day, General. Mrs. Logan. Good day, Mrs. Randall. Why, Mrs. Randall, how do you do? I didn't see you at the homecoming celebration. No. There was no homecoming for my son, General Logan. Oh. Oh, my, my deepest sympathy, Mrs. Randall. I didn't know. He was killed, fighting for his country. A country that has already forgotten him. Mrs. Randall, it will never oh, forget. Oh, yes, forgotten. The cheers and the speeches and the celebrations... They are for those who came back. Those who didn't come back are forgotten. My son is forgotten. Except by me. Good day, General Logan. But she's mistaken, John. We all remember and appreciate. Mary, I wonder if that's true. You know, sometimes it's so easy to forget. Have some more coffee, John. What? Oh, no, no, thank you, Mary. Are you scarcely eating a thing, dear? Well, I keep thinking. There must be some way. Some way of showing how much we appreciate their sacrifices. How much we treasure their memories. I guess all we can do is remember them in our prayers, John. And I wonder how many do that. John, a few years ago, Mr. Lincoln gave a speech. It was something about those who gave their lives for our country. It was in the paper... I think I clipped it out and put it... Oh, let me see. Yes, it's in one of these books. Here it is. July 3rd, 1863. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created. shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. That's beautiful, John. It brings out the real purpose of their sacrifices. Mary, we must set aside one day a year to be sure that their sacrifices are not forgotten. And John... It should be a day in springtime when all the flowers are in bloom. And so on a spring day in 1866, in the town square of Carbondale, a simple parade assembles. It is headed by General John Logan. The band is playing solemn patriotic airs. The people of the community and over 200 former soldiers of both the Confederate and Union armies march side by side down the main street and out to Woodlawn Cemetery. At the cemetery, 
the graves are decorated, then the crowd stands in reverent silence as a voice is raised in prayer. O oh God, from whom cometh all life and peace, grant to those who have given the full measure of devotion to their country everlasting peace and grant unity to this nation that we may always remain one country and one people. Oh, General Logan, I, I want to thank you for what you did today. It, yes, it was, I understand, Mrs. Randall. It's consoling to know that Eddie isn't forgotten. His memory will live on. This is going to be an annual ceremony in Carbondale. If only the whole country could join in this day. Mary, I've been thinking of that. To designate a day on which our entire nation can join in prayer and remember. Nearly two years later, General Logan became commander of the Grand Army of the Republic. And from his headquarters in Washington, D.C., on May 5th, 1868, he issues his general orders number 11. The 30th of May is designated as a day of memorial to those who died in defense of our country. Let no ravages of time testify to the present or to coming generations that we, as a people, have forgotten the cost of a free and undivided republic. By order of John A. Logan, Commander. Across the broad fields and white roads of America tonight, there are memories and millions of homes. We salute the unsung heroes who gave their lives that America might live in freedom and peace. Let their memory be ever fresh, and may God in his infinite mercy give them eternal peace. On this coming Memorial Day, let us rededicate our lives to the freedom of this nation and to the peace and unity in all our homes. Let the name of God be on our lips and a prayer in our hearts. For in the strong bonds of family life is the strength of our nation. And in peace and unity, the family that prays together stays together. This is Mona Freeman saying good night and God bless you. Our thanks to Lee Bunnell and Gail Storm for their performances this evening and to Ruth Bourne and Mabel Thompson Rao for writing tonight's play. Music was scored and conducted by Max Tear. This production of Family Theater Incorporated was directed by David Young. Others who appeared in tonight's play were Barry Kruger as narrator, Cy Kendall, Michael Hayes, Shepard Strudwick, Lillian Bayef, and Bob Purcell. Next week, our Family Theater stars will be Ward Bond and Mary Eleanor Donahue in The High Boarded Fence. Your host will be Lon McAllister. This series of the Family Theater broadcast is made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this kind of program and by the mutual broadcasting system which has responded to this need. Be with us next week at the same time. Tony Lafrano speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>